Hello and welcome back to the channel. My apologies for the long delay in uploading. I have been tied up with law school and with visiting my loved ones during break. I hope that you all had a wonderful holiday season. If you love naval history like I do and want to see more naval history content, both from the age of sail and the modern era, please like, comment, and subscribe. Let's start with a review of the basic rules that govern line ship combat. Sailing ships are reliant on the wind for maneuvers in battle. The wind's direction dictates where a line ship may go at any given time. Most sailing ships have around a 60 degree dead zone called the irons, in which they cannot make sailing progress. A ship can turn through the wind, but going through irons to turn can put significant stress on masts and rigging. A ship will generally achieve optimal speed while sailing at a beam reach or a broad reach. Though it is inherently more difficult to go upwind than it is to go downwind, using a close haul or a close reach and tacking through the wind or wearing around with the wind, which is also called jibing, one can still travel upwind. Ship speed is largely determined by the amount of sail area that is in contact with the wind. The more sails that are catching wind, the more power the ship has. There is one other important factor when it comes to a ship's speed. Over time, if a hull is not maintained, marine life can build up on the bottom of it, making the ship unable to reach its top speed. Covering the bottom of the hull in copper sheathing would prevent worms from eating up into the wood and would prevent many types of marine life from latching on to the hull. In terms of wind positioning, generally speaking, being on the upwind side of the battle is advantageous. It allows a ship to control the engagement. As ships struggle to move upwind, it can maintain its distance, close with the enemy, or escape. A ship that has an advantageous wind position over its opponent is said to have the weather gauge. A ship's position in relation to the wind can also affect its gunnery. Waves follow the wind and a ship sailing parallel to the wind at a beam reach would have its firing solution thrown off by the rolling of the ship caused by the waves. Ship's crews would have to predict the roll of the ship and fire at the correct moment if they wanted to score hits. As wind applies pressure to the sails, the entire ship tilts at an angle. This is called heel. The heel of a ship can also make gunnery more difficult. This will elevate the guns on the windward side and depress the guns on the leeward side. Heel is primarily determined by the angle one is moving in relation to the wind and is also determined by the wind speed. A ship moving with full sails will experience more heel than a ship that has only some of its sails deployed. Ships during the Age of Sail were generally armed with some variety of long guns and carronades. Long guns, which could reach out to considerable ranges, formed the backbone of most raided line ships' armament. The HMS Victory had 32-pounder long guns on her lower deck, referring to the weight of shot fired from the gun. First rates generally carried 32-pounders, or their nation's equivalent, on their bottom deck, 24s on their second deck, and 9-12-pounders on their third deck. Carronades were shortened weapons firing heavy shot at close range. HMS Victory used some 68-pound carronades to great effect at Trafalgar. As far as ammunition goes, these weapons, both long guns and carronades, could fire round shot, chain shot, and grape shot, along with anything else that could be put down the barrel and propelled at high velocity. Sometimes, in close-range engagements, Cannon would be double or even triple loaded with round shot for maximum impact. Sailing ships were generally difficult to sink using round shot. Though ballistics tests, see the link in the description below, show that age of sail cannon can shoot through basically any wooden structure they are put up against, actually sinking a ship during an engagement was relatively rare. Sinking a ship generally required many shots below the waterline or the detonation of a powder magazine. Cannons did not have great accuracy when fired from a moving platform against another moving vessel. Inexperienced crews would, of course, make any gunnery shortcomings worse. Cannons were generally hard to aim and maneuver, with even the most competent crews struggling to get out around a minute. With most cannon crews, three rounds every five minutes was a realistic expectation. 
So even if a ship was exposed to fire at long range for a prolonged period, it would be unlikely to be knocked out of the fight. Close-range gunnery allowed for more decisive engagements. A short-range rake of ball and grape shot could do significant damage to a ship's crew, cannons, and morale. Lastly, there was a strong incentive to take ships as prizes rather than sinking them, as crews would receive substantial monetary rewards. As every European power was building their ships to a similar standard, captured ships could also be put back into service with relative ease, meaning that a victory could shift the balance of power substantially, as every ship lost by one side could be gained by the other impressed into service. Many popular videos on YouTube discuss the concept of crossing the T, either in the context of the Age of Sail or modern naval combat. Crossing the T can concentrate gunfire against the lead ships of a column, and can inflict substantial damage under the right circumstances. Ships of the line had very few bow and stern facing cannons, so when they were in a line ahead formation, their firepower was extremely limited. Though crossing the T allowed for a superior concentration of force while the line of enemy ships closed, it could not guarantee victory, and could be overwhelmed if the T was cut. Though the victory and the Royal Sovereign both suffered substantial damage while closing with the Franco-Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar, they remained combat capable and successfully cut through the Franco-Spanish formation. Due to difficulties inherent to the art of naval gunnery, perhaps crossing the T was not nearly as effective as many would assume. Furthermore, crossing the T only allowed the superior formation to fire on the lead ships of a column, allowing the following ships to approach almost completely unscathed. Crossing the T was likely largely ineffective, as if one could not inflict sufficient damage on the enemy vessels during the closing phase, then it could put a superior fleet in a disadvantageous position, allowing the superior fleet to be divided up and defeated in detail, as Nelson did to the Franco-Spanish formation at the Battle of Trafalgar. As it seems that crossing the T could do more harm than good, the best bet was to close to a relatively short range and to try to concentrate firepower against an opponent's formation. Having two ships barrage one would be an effective strategy, so long as one had local numerical superiority. Enveloping an enemy formation was another effective strategy. This would involve putting ships on either side of the enemy ship. Some refer to this tactic as doubling. Interestingly enough, different nations had different styles of naval combat. The French seemed more inclined to attack mass and rigging, while the British tended to focus on shooting at the hulls of enemy vessels. In a straight-up gunfight, the better-trained crew would generally win, unless a ship was facing multiple opponents of only slightly inferior skill. Lastly, we have the tactic which I will refer to as cutting the T. This was responsible for the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson divided his numerically inferior but qualitatively superior force into two columns, intending to cut the Franco-Spanish line in two locations and prevent certain elements of the Franco-Spanish formation, the vanguard, from participating in the battle. Though Victory, Royal Sovereign, and some of the other ships in the lead of the two columns were somewhat heavily damaged, cutting the line allowed the ships to close to exceptionally close range where their gunnery had maximum impact. The French flagship Bucentaur fell victim to a rake from the British flagship Victory, which killed many of her crew and left the ship largely combat ineffective for the rest of the battle. The battle eventually devolved into a brawl, where superior British coordination, gunnery, and seamanship carried the day. Trafalgar stands as the best example of the vulnerabilities of attempting to cross an opponent's T. This theme, actually, repeats itself, going forward in history to the Battle of Lissa. The Italians came to the field with a technologically superior fleet. The Austro-Hungarians still managed to break their line, and uh, yes, there, there was a lot of ramming involved in that battle. It turned into another brawl, kind of like the brawl at Trafalgar. So, there is yet another battle where crossing an opponent's T did not assure victory. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. I hope you'll leave me a like, a comment, and subscribe. 
If you noticed any errors in this video, please feel free to put them down in the comments below, because I'm sure there will be some. <laughs> it's inevitable. For those of you who have made it this far in the video, is crossing the T a good strategy, or does it do more harm than good? Does it allow an opponent to cut through your line more easily, divide up your force and destroy it? Or do the advantages during the closing phase, where you can mass your firepower upon your opponent, outweigh the disadvantages of potentially having your line cut? Please let me know in the comments below, and thanks again for watching.